Good morning, church. It's wonderful to see you today. This is a double day. We're going to talk about the glory of God today, but it's also Patriots Day. Now, that is the new holiday that's been designed to remember the terrorist attacks on our nation on September the 11th. I spent time there, as you are, many of you are well aware. During that time, I got to learn things about the Lord that I never thought I would learn any other way. You learn more in tragedy than you do in good times. You just do. Uh, like the little poem that I've read to you before, I walked a mile with pleasure she chattered all the way, but I was none the wiser for what she had to say. But I walked a mile with sorrow. Not a word, said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. I remember walking or looking across from Jersey City to New York City. We mustered at Journal Square in New Jersey, and you could see across the river smoke billowing. We got there late in the night. They had the searchlights on, and it was the most eerie thing I've ever seen. Uh, when the morning broke early, we took a tour of that area before we started working as our chaplain's group was developing. Uh, there was a little... Port Authority police officer. I say he's that big, but he may have been bigger. But he, uh, he he's giant now. He was assigned to us, and he had no, no regard for God, no regard for chaplains, and he did not like having to chauffeur us around. So when we finished that first day, and he told us how much he didn't like us, we covenanted together to pray for his salvation. I was there through September. They made me come home. I went back in December. But every time we would switch out chaplains, we would pray for this Port Authority officer. One day, Gary Malchus was talking with him. He's a chaplain out in California. And Bobby said to Gary on the day Gary was leaving, I, I, I'm really, I really need to know what is so different about you chaplains. And Gary said, well, I've got to leave, but I know Ricky's coming in. When he walks in, you grab him and talk to him, see if he can help you. So he pulled me aside, Bobby did. We went into a room, and he said, tell me how to be saved and I went through grace, through faith, that not of ourselves, gift of God, everything that you'd expect. He said, well, Gary's been talking. To every chaplain, I don't know what it is about you guys. Every one of you have come in here and talked to me about Jesus. But he said, I'm ready to be saved today. We knelt on our knees. This was before they were bad or worse. And somehow, my phone was in my back pocket, and it dialed one of our chaplains in California. And he heard the whole prayer. We knelt, he prayed, he cried, and uh, then I kept hearing a voice. Ricky, Lord, <laughs> what did I do wrong? Nothing. I reached back, and it was Greg Smith. Uh, chaplain in, in uh, San Bernardino, and he said, I heard the whole thing. We're rejoicing. Uh, I'm going to pick up Gary when he lands, and I'm going to tell him. I said, all right, you do that. Bobby was baptized about uh, three months later. His wife, his son, and his daughter were all baptized the same day in an independent Baptist church out in the creek. It was an outdoor wedding. I've got a picture that they sent. God can bring glory to himself, even through trauma. So when you go home today, don't 
re-traumatize yourself by watching all of the 911 and all this kind of thing. They'll be they'll be running those on A and E and other places. Uh, don't re-traumatize yourself, but be very very mindful of the military, of the first responders, of the 3,000 plus who died that day, not just in New York, but in the Pentagon, outside Pennsylvania. Those people who rose up and determined that they were not, we were not going to let this stop us. I don't know what you think of George Bush, but he shined through this. He was very, very introverted, very passive when he knew that so many Americans were in trouble. They flew him to Shreveport, then they loaded him back up and flew him to North Dakota or Kansas or Nebraska, somewhere up there. Then he said, I've got to get home, so he went back to Washington, even though there were threats against the Capitol and against the White House. One thing he did say, my fellow Americans, please pray for wisdom. That's what we needed. And thus started the longest war we've ever been in. And the war is continuing, folks. We every day are going to have to stand up and say, God, bless America. We repent. Pour your blessing out. Anyway, greetings. We're going to sing. I know that may be a little downer, but folks, I'm wearing... My red, white, and blue, much to the chagrin of my bride. I've got my flag on my tie. I've got my blue coat and my red and white striped shirt. And I am a fashion faux pas today, but I don't care. Today is the day the Lord has made. Matthew, come and lead us. Amen. Well, let's all stand. Let's praise the Lord this morning. We're going to sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. The county heavenly anthems drums, all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. Match this king through all eternity. And crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now. We have a couple of things we need to pray about, especially today. Uh, Victor is going to be leaving for Mexico on Friday. Pray that he has a successful 
visit down there and was able to look and see how effective the work is or needs to be. Uh, you don't even know what you're going into, do you? Okay, well, good. So that's a fruit of the prior visit. So he will come back and give us a report on that on the 25th. Uh, next Sunday, I'm going to preach on the Great Commission, maybe. And I'm going to preface that because I think that is part of the key to any, uh, any congregation's life. Uh, keep your bulletin open if you don't have it because we're going to talk a little bit about that left-sided, in, that inside left page. I want you to keep that. That's something you can clip out, laminate, slap in your brain, because that is the essence of salvation. That's about as concise as we know how to make it. So we want to keep that uh, in your mind. Secondly, on the 25th, Pastor Frank and his congregation are going to prepare lunch for us. And they said, as many as want to come. So if you've got some friends or somebody that needs something to eat, bring them. Teddy, you going to have a date for that day when we have lunch here? You'll see. Okay, okay. He's going to see. <laughs> but we want to make sure that that is done. Pray for Julie as she sits there with Jean. Uh it's tough on her, but she is strong. She can handle it. Uh, my son's wife had a great loss this week. Uh, the little dog that she stayed was that was with her when her husband left her, not my son, but the other one, uh, left her with those two girls. During the night, it was Buddy that would cuddle her. During the day, it was he who would watch out with her. And they'd go walking and everything. Thirteen years old. Was at some kind of a husky or something. I'm not sure what its breed was. But whatever it was, uh, prostate cancer uh, started eating him up. And they put him down. And it was a tough day for them. So just remember April. Uh, I don't know that they're watching today. If they're not in their own church. You better be watching, boy. There, he's been fussed at. And if he's not watching, then uh, hopefully he will hear this, and so will April. We're praying for them for sure. Um, again, like I mentioned, let's keep our military in your prayers. They are not out of danger right now. Uh, even though we're not highly escalating any kind of a war, we're still involved, folks, and we're going to be until the Lord comes. So let's keep praying for them. Any prayer requests from you, anyone? All right, well, let's pray. Father in heaven, for as long as we've lived, we've known that you are the Son of God. Lord Jesus, we know you died on the cross for us. We know you rose from the dead. We know that we're saved by grace through faith. And Lord, because of that, we give glory to God. All glory belongs to Him. And our songs this morning focus on your glory. So Heavenly Father, give our thoughts clarity. Give our words sincerity and let the power of your scripture impress on us how valuable it is to give honor and glory to God alone. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand again. Let's continue to praise him and give God the glory. So we praise thee, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, find the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for 
for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain. Who had borne all our sins and had cleansed every stain? Alleluia, thine the glory. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be Father, thank you for this time of worship and the wonderful things that you're doing through us. Lord, continue to watch over us, continue to heal us if we're sick, and be with those that are not well. Be with Brother Ricky as he brings the message and speaks your name. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There is a motto that grew out of the Protestant Reformation. It was Solo Dio Gloria, S-D-G. It was so important 
that artists and composers who firmly believed in the glory of God would put that on their manuscripts. The one you've probably heard from or heard about is Johann Sebastian Bach. You look at any of his compositions and down in the bottom of each manuscript he has written S D G Solo Dio Gloria Everything he did he wanted everyone to know was for the glory of God not for Bach Artist would sign their name to their portraits. They would write S-D-G. It's one of the ways you can tell when the paintings were done. It was like 9-11. When I drove home from New York after my first stint there, there were bridges covered with American flags. There were patriotic hymns and songs being played on the radio over and over again because nobody wanted to forget what had happened. I was coming through Howe today and I looked up there and on that bridge were two fire trucks facing each other, ladder trucks. They had their ladders out and they were tying an American flag on those two ladder trucks. I was too early to see the finished product but I know what they were doing. They were going to extend their ladders real high so that banner could be seen from both ways on 75. They were going to remember the day. There was a way of capturing the essence of what the Reformation was all about and they're called the five solas. But I want you to recognize that they are precariously illuminating, but they're not complete. And the reason is they were just saying, uh, by grace alone. That's not a complete thought. There has to be more to it. Uh, there are modifiers. They're just hanging in the air prepositional phrases, if you will, uh, and it, it was difficult for people to grab, get in their mind what was really being said. Now, Martin Luther and the Reformers did not come up with these particular words. They were developed a little bit later on, kind of like uh, uh, John Calvin's points. We have the five-point Calvinism. He didn't come up with that. Somebody else did out of his teaching. And, and there are many times when we have to sit back and say, okay, so what in the world does this have to do with me? Only by grace, only by faith, only by Christ, only by the Scripture. What does it have to do with me? Let me tell you what it has to do with you. And I want you to listen carefully. Your justification, your salvation hangs on these principles. And what I, I, want, I want you to get your bulletin, open it up, look to the left, cross from the flag, and you'll see what John Piper has written. Now John Piper is uh, now Pastor Emeritus from uh, Bethlehem Baptist Church up in Minneapolis. Uh, we attended that church when we took a little excursion up there, but he was not there. They had somebody else preaching. I don't know what it was, but it didn't matter. Uh, Piper is part of the Reformed group. I read after John MacArthur, who is pretty much a reformist. I've read after R.C. Spruill at Ligonier Ministries. R.C. is now passed on but he wrote 100 books or so. Probably as clear a thinker as C.S. Lewis, only a little bit easier to read. A <laughs> little bit. Uh, but these reformers, D 
didn't like the way the prepositions were hanging out there. So Piper wrote this, justification before God, salvation before God, all right? By grace alone, with no merited favor, whatever. On the basis of Christ alone, with no other sacrifice or righteousness as the foundation. Through the means of faith alone, not including any human works whatsoever, to the end that all things lead ultimately to the glory of God alone, as taught with final and decisive authority in the Scriptures alone. Now when you put it like that, you have to sit back and scratch your head to a degree. How come it is people can't understand that? Well, it's not easy to understand. I'll tell you right now. Anytime you deal with a subject in the theological realm, you are dealing with something that is so far above our finite minds that an infinite God had to write it down, but he didn't codify it. What that means is he didn't say, okay, step one, step two, step three. He gave the totality of Scripture. And when you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God. You can stop right there. That's all. In the beginning, God. And you go to the very last of Revelation, and you find, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. So we start with God, we finish with the great amen, and everything in between is meant to bring glory to God alone. He alone. How do sinners gain a right standing with God so that God is 100% for us and not against us? I don't think we grasp the glory of God. We think of God's house, but that's something that God has. We think of God's work, but that's something that God does. When we talk about the glory of God, we're talking about what God is, who God is. He is glory. He is ultimate glory. And everything in this world must bring glory to Him. If glory doesn't come to Him, we have a major, major problem. And we don't want to have a problem, especially when it comes to God. There's extraordinary care and precision in the way God wrote the Scripture. And since it's Scripture alone that's our final authority, not a decree from somebody else, not a a catechism, though I'm going to quote the Westminster Catechism here in a little bit. Uh, It's not a man-written document. It's the power of God himself. I want to be, number one, biblical. And I believe I've been that. I think I'm biblical to the nth. One thing that just tickled me to death before I went with International Commission down to Australia, we sent emails forward and uh, tried to set up appointments with different Baptist churches. And there was one group outside of Goulburn, Australia. Now, Goulburn is where the police academy, the national academy is. And I was going to speak at that academy, and then I was going to speak at a church. Well, The head of that church was also the head of, I guess, what we'd call our Collin Baptist Association. He had a whole bunch of folks, and he had written back, yes, we'll be delighted to hear you. We're excited about you coming. Well, before I left, I got another email. 
and it was copied to all those other pastors, and he said, Brothers, I've been on the web page of First Baptist in McKinney, where this uh, brother is from, and honestly, I think he may be too liberal for us. Jerry Bird came up. He said, I can't believe anybody would call you liberal in any kind of way except maybe in giving, uh, but you're not liberal. I said, I know it. But anyway, I went ahead and visited with them, and they finally agreed that I was not that, I was not liberal, but that I did have a purpose, and I, so I went ahead and visited with them. Uh, but we have to recognize that the modifiers of salvation have to be understood because of two points. We are spiritually dead and we're legally guilty before God. We talked about this when we went to Ephesians chapter 2. You who were dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead in trespass, but you were also guilty because all have sinned and come short of the glory, pardon me, short of the glory of God. When we come to that realization and we understand something that's well beyond us, we say, why is there even a need for God to justify us by grace? Why? There it is. You are spiritually dead. You're legally guilty. We deserve eternal hell. Instead, God sent His own Son to settle both of those issues. And we're going to see that as we go today. We are under the just and holy wrath of God because of our sin. So, God in His great mercy sent Jesus Christ. And when He sent Him, the ultimate principle was not just so you could get saved, but so you could be saved to bring Him glory. We fail to add that. Everything that we do must bring glory to God. Every decision we make ought to be geared toward bringing glory to God. The ultimate transaction of the cross, the ultimate transaction of resurrection, must be the ultimate glory of God. And you sit back and you start to think about that. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm an old sinner saved by grace. Hallelujah. Look at me. No, no, no. I'm saved by the grace of God. Look at Him. Look at what He has done. He is the one who wrought my salvation. He is the one who allowed His Son to die. And He didn't do it just for me. He did it for His own glory. Now you say, well, are we not to be proud of our salvation? Well, of course we are. But if we were to look at what the glory of God is, we can look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. And one called to another and said, now these are angels, the cherubim, they're flying around the throne of God as Isaiah is there in the temple. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. The glory of God. The holiness of God. The word holy means separated from the common as a very simple definition. Uh, sanctified is how we would say it because we are not holy. We're to be holy as He is holy, but we fail. So we have a step-down word called sanctify. When we were growing up, we had two pair of shoes. We had school shoes and we had church school shoes. The church shoes, if they still fit, 
<laughs> when you're growing, they don't fit all the time. When that happens, they are now set apart. They're sanctified, you see? And if they're sanctified, they're set apart, they're sort of holy. God, however, is what we use as a phrase, the thrice holy God of Israel. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is He. I heard that song coming in on the radio this morning. Holy is He. What a dynamic song. And many times we, pardon me, many times we come to a point where we fail to recognize the holiness of God and the glory of God. I'm going to overcome this, y'all just hold tight. Holy, glory, God. Three elements that we cannot be. We're supposed to try to be holy, but let's be honest. We're we're still locked in this old veil of flesh. Holy is God. The glory is God's. And yet we strut ourselves down the halls and down the main streets of our cities thinking we are freeborn Americans too good to be damned. Boy, have we missed it. Nobody will attack America. Why would they? I'll tell you why they would. They would to humble us. Churches were more full of people on that Wednesday than they've ever been before. You couldn't find a parking spot at a church in this city. I tried. I mean, it was full on Wednesday night. People were coming to pray, but they weren't praying for anything other than the nation. Unfortunately, ask them to pray for revival. How many will show up? Ask them to pray that God pour out His Spirit on us. How many would show up? But you let Twin Towers fall. You let a Pentagon be destroyed. You let an airplane fall out of the sky because passengers would not allow that plane to do any other damage at the expense of their own lives. And we would glorify America. The glory of God is the outward radiance of the intrinsic worth and beauty and greatness of His manifold perfection. The glory of God. The glory of God is such that we must recognize only Him and only He alone. Now, I say the radiance of His beauty as opposed to what Jonathan Edwards said. Jonathan Edwards was a great preacher, high intellect. Here's what he said. All that is ever spoken of in Scripture as an ultimate end of God's work, is included in one phrase, the glory of God. The refulgence, that's radiance. He just uses a different word. The radiance shines upon and into the creature and is reflected back to the luminary. The beams of glory come from God and are something of God, and are refunded back again to the original, so that the whole is of God, and in God, 
and to God. And God is the beginning, middle, and end of the affair. What he's saying is, we are the full moon. God is the sun. Okay, what is the, did you see the full moon set yesterday? Oh, goodness, I, Julie and I sat out the other night in the hot tub and <clears throat> we were almost mad at the trees because they were kind of hiding the moon for a little bit. But you know, the moon is nothing more than one giant luminary. It has no intrinsic light of its own. If the sun were not reflecting off of the reflective material of the moon, it would have no light. Now let's put that here to us. Folks, we have nothing to give. Nothing. Except to reflect the light for the glory of God. That's who we are. That's what the glory of God's all about in us. <clears throat> we come to a point where we are nothing but giant luminaries reflective of the glory of God. Well, what is the glory of God? <clears throat> Psalm 19.1 <clears throat> The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Look, when you walk out at night and you see that moon, don't sit back and say, Oh, precious moon, thank you for giving us light in the night. No, no, no. <clears throat> the moon is a reflector. The sun is the light. Oh, great Lord, thank you for giving me all that I have and all that I'll ever be. Oh, I'm so good. It's amazing that God doesn't thump the back of our head and give us a coronary when we take glory from Him. Lord, thank You for allowing me to reflect Your glory because it's Your glory that we have to hang on to. Isaiah 43. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, everyone, all of you, whom I created, why? For my glory, whom I formed and made. Why did God make you? For the glory of God only. He didn't make me this tall and this wide. No, he made me this tall and this wide. I added the rest of the width. But he made me to demonstrate glory to the world. Glory to God. Only glory to God. What does Ephesians 1 say? In him... We have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. We are to bring glory to God and God alone. Romans eleven thirty six. From Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. And that word amen means case closed. To Him be glory forever. Case closed. Romans 9. In order to make known the riches of His glory for vessels of mercy which He has prepared when? Beforehand for glory. Every good 
deed we perform is for the riches of His glory. Every prayer we pray is for His glory. Oh, I know we ask for things ourselves. And I pray, oh Lord, help uh, uh, give comfort and peace to April. My daughter-in-law who lost her dog this week. Is that worthy of prayer? You bet it is. Because it gives glory to God. Lord, when I go out to eat, may my face shine with your reflective power so that you can have glory. And somebody in that restaurant may say, wow, look at them. (laughs) They kind of shine. They have the glory of God. A church is nothing more than a giant reflective luminary. We shine and reflect the glory of God. And if we don't do that, we have major problems. Romans 15. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Why? For the glory of God. We often stop at that first. Welcome, it says on our doormat. Welcome, it says, uh, on our sign. Welcome for the glory of God. Are you starting to get the gist of these verses? Everything in this world is for the glory of God. The goal of everything is that the glory of God may be seen. Romans 15.9. 15.9. Do I have that one? I don't. I'll just read it. Christ became a servant in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. When you read in the book of Isaiah 42... I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I will give to no other, nor praise, nor my praise to carved idols. Isaiah 2, 11, The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the lofty pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. You may know that I'm kind of enamored with this James Webb telescope and the pictures that are coming out. They just tickle me to death. One guy said the other day on the television, why is there such a meaningless vastness of uninhabited galaxies and only one tiny dot of human existence? How dare we think that that's all there is to the universe? And he was talking to Christians. I didn't get to respond, but if I had of, the universe is not intended to portray the importance of man, sir. Get this in your head. It's intended to give man some inkling of the grandeur of God, and that is an understatement. There's one phrase in Genesis that just blows my brain. It's talking about the creation. And then that little phrase says, and God created the stars also. That was it. Why? So we can sit out at night and look into the vastness of the black velvet, the diamond stars that are blinking, sometimes orange, sometimes blue, sometimes multicolored. And if you stay out long enough and look long enough, you can see it, especially when winter comes on. You can see it in the constellation Orion. Up in that top right shoulder is Betelgeuse, the brilliant, beautiful red giant star. Down in the left-hand corner, around his knee or his hip, you find the bright, bluish Rigel. 
And there it is. Two fantastic colors and different stars in between. All of them point for one thing. The Apostle Paul said that anyone, every man, doesn't matter whether you're a freeborn American or whether you're born in Africa or India or China or South America, doesn't matter where you're born, you can look up and you can see the glory of God so that no one is without excuse. We are there by the glory of God. You know, God is most glorified in His justified people when His justified people are satisfied with Him. John Piper and others have used a phrase called Christian hedonism. I don't like that. I don't think there is such a thing, but what they're using, they're using the word hedonism as a method of joy. But we have different connotations today, so I'm going to just go to the Westminster Confession. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Well, that's simple, isn't it? What is the chief end of man? It's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now notice how those in that confession, 1600s roughly, I don't know how far back, notice the third word. The chief end. Notice that it's singular, not plural. It's not we have two chief ends. We have one chief end and it's all together to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. When we glorify God because He justified us, He saved us, then we are to enjoy that justification and God gets glory from our joy. Why do you think the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of His people? He wants us to praise Him. And He wants us to praise Him with all kinds of stuff, with piano. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately with guitar. What about drums? What about a trumpet? What about my auto harp? I've been practicing when they ring those golden bells on my auto harp. And I can almost make the bells ring. I may need to play that one day. Get me a podcast. Ricky and his phenomenal auto harp. You had to cuddle it kind of like a sweet young lady. and Just play the strings. Oh, it's so sweet. But folks, we are to enjoy God. Think about it. We're to have fun with God. I tell a lot of couples when I do their weddings now, I want to give you a charge. I want you to have tons of holy fun. Learn to laugh with each other. Learn to know what it's like to bring joy and glory to the world. Paul said in Philippians 1.20 that for me to die is gain. Why would he say that? He said, for me to die is the ultimate satisfaction and the ultimate testimony to the glory of God. Everything we do ought to bring glory to Him. Jonathan Edwards, one more time. God is glorified not only by His glories being seen, but by its being rejoiced in when those that see it delight in it, God is more glorified than if they only see it. We ought to praise God that we can bring glory to God. Think about it. God has everything for His own glory. Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. God, this is what you do. You made known the path of life. 
I'm justified. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. God wants us to enjoy being saved. I've seen so many in revival meetings when I used to do those. People would sit there with their arms folded and to quote Eddie Middleton, they'd say, <coughs> bless me if you can. Man, I don't have any use for them who sit there with a sour puss on their face. When they try to sing, they'll sing, all glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain who's bought all our sin and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine glory. Is that how you sing it? You really don't want me to burst out in song here, do you? Come on, give me something. Hallelujah, thine the glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, man. We ought to enjoy praising God. Because that's the chief end of man, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And if we're not doing it, we're missing something. Oh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Romans 8.30 Those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. We are to demonstrate the glory, the glory of God. You know, you, uh, you can't put all of the glory of God into us on this earth. Moses tried it. He said, Lord, show me your glory. And God said, I can't do that, Moses. But if I'll hide you in a cliff of a rock and I'll put my hand over you. And when I walk by, you can see the outermost part. You can see the, the, the afterglow. And it so affected Moses, he could no longer stand before the people without a veil over his face because it shone like the morning sun. You might as well try to put a jet engine in a Corvette as to put the glory of God in us this side of heaven. You cannot put glory in inglorious people. But what you can do, those of you who've trusted Him, no matter how sinful you've been, whether you're watching on the internet or whether you're here in this auditorium, Regardless of what your past has been, remember, you can be justified by grace alone with no merited favor whatever. And you're justified on the basis of Christ alone with no other sacrifice or righteousness as foundation. You are justified through the means of faith alone not including any human works whatsoever to the end that you might enjoy God alone as the supreme treasure of your life displaying the glory that ultimately belongs to God. That's about all the honey I can get out of that beehive today. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation or a last final song You'll throw that up, Wes. <clears throat> Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. And He will surely give you rest by trusting in His 
this word. Would you bow in prayer for a moment? Lord in heaven, open our hearts to give you glory today. Let everyone who needs Christ come to him. And let this day be a dynamic day of victory and glory and praise. For you are the Lamb who was slain. And Lord, we come just trusting you. Would you stand with me as we sing it? You know the song. Come every soul, my sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. And He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Now you know this chorus. Come on. Only trust Him. Only trust Him. Only trust Him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. And we all ought to say to the glory of God, to the glory of God. Amen. God bless you, brethren.